So today on the Red Coat History podcast and YouTube channel, we're here at the Guards Museum. It's in central London, just down the road from Buckingham Palace. What a lot of people don't realise is those guys you see in their red tunics and bearskins during the trooping of the colour and standing outside Buckingham Palace are not just for show. They're real trained infantrymen with a long history of combat experience and that's what we're here to find out all about today. We're also going to be learning how you can differentiate the different uniforms that they wear on parade and stay tuned to the end to find out about the mysterious missing regiment of guards. Leave your comments below, especially if you served in the Guards. Let us know, send us some of your memories. We are the museum for the five regiments of foot guards and we tell their story through 380 years of their history and an amazingly rich collection that covers all five of them. The history of the foot guards goes back in time to 1642. Yep, over 380 years. But it is a bit of a choppy history with regiments being disbanded and reformed. Today, there are five regiments of foot guards. The senior is the Grenadier Guards. They were raised in 1656 to protect the exiled King Charles II. So what's distinctive about their uniforms? Because they're senior in first place, they have a single button down the front of the tunic there. They have the grenade on the collar, and that's a fizzing bomb that you would have thrown at the enemy in the days before the modern grenades. And they have the white plume on this side of the bearskin cap across here. You see that white plume that marks them as a grenadier guard. It's the easiest thing to spot. The Coldstream Guards is the oldest continuously serving regular regiment in the British Army. It was formed in 1650 as Monk's Regiment of Foot. Despite being older, it is the second most senior regiment of foot guards. And this hierarchy doesn't mean they're necessarily the oldest or the best. It's the formal hierarchy that they've been placed within the uh, brigade. They are in second place, so they have buttons in pairs along the front. They have the garter star on their collar badge, and they have a bright red plume on the opposite side of the bear skin. The reason they're on opposite sides is these two regiments would have either flank of the battlefield, and they would need to look across the battlefield to identify each other, hence plumes on the other side. Our third regiment is the Scots Scars, third in line of hierarchy, and yes, Perhaps you've guessed it already, they have their buttons in threes along the tunic. They have the thistle on their collar, which is the Scottish national emblem, and they have no plume. The theory for this being that they stand between the other two regiments and therefore there's no point having a plume for identification purposes. The Irish Guards were formed in 1900 by order of Queen Victoria. It was recognition of the many acts of bravery performed by Irish regiments during the Second Anglo-Boer War recruited originally from Ireland and now recruited mainly from Northern Ireland or Ulster. They're fourth in line, so they have their buttons in fours. This is a drummer's outfit, which is slightly different, but they would normally have a shamrock on their collar, obviously the Irish symbol, and they have a turquoise plume on this side of the bearskin cap. Many people would think, ah, oh, well, if they're an Irish regiment, why do they not have a lovely emerald green plume? Well, they were late to the army formed in 1900 and the other regiments of which there were many were using shades of green so they picked this colour from the order of St Patrick which is a, a sash belt and that's the colour that they have. The Welsh Guards are the newest of the regiments formed in 1915. Their buttons in fives. Now they have the leek on their collar which I gather is the only vegetable to appear on a British military uniform so there's an interesting pub quiz fact for you. And we have a white, green and white plume on this side of the bearskin cap. Coincidentally, the colours of the leek, but also linked back to the Welsh roots for the Tudor family and Henry VIII's family, of which they trace their roots back. So the foot guards are an important part of the security of the British royal family. But how seriously are you taking your own security? I have to, I travel a lot. For example, at the minute, I'm at home in South Africa. Now I'm in England. You can tell that because it's raining. And now I'm in Ukraine. So I know a lot of you guys are either serving or former military and you're probably hard as nails. But either way, you might have a weak spot, cyber security. And that's where today's sponsor Surfshark comes in. Did you know that public Wi-Fi, such as in hotels or malls, are a favorite way for hackers to access your personal data? They use what's called a man-in-the-middle method to get you to log on to a fake Wi-Fi. Scary stuff. But there are ways to beat the hackers. 
Obviously, if you have a local SIM card loaded with data, then you can use that. But if you don't, then do what I do and install a VPN, which is a virtual private network. It encrypts your traffic and hides your IP address, making you a hard target. I'm using Surfshark VPN. It works really well at keeping me safe from hackers while traveling. If you want to keep your info safe and support the show at the same time, follow the link that I've put on screen now. It's also in the description below. When you sign up with my code, you will get three extra months for free on your subscription. Also, Surfshark offer a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk in trying it out. The Guards regiments have battle honours all the way back to the 17th century, Tangier, Namur, Gibraltar and others. So Lee, obviously the regiments have been involved in many, many operations across mm -hmm. the centuries. You've got some great exhibitions and displays here. Can you maybe show us a few of your favourites? Well, this one is our Waterloo display here. Uh, all of this display is on that one battle with artefacts brought back from the battlefield itself. The battle itself was the, perhaps the key battle that the guards were famous for at the time. It was the battle that ended Napoleon's dreams of conquering Europe and the guards came out of it as national heroes because of the key parts that they played in it. The exploits of the guards at Waterloo are legendary. They were tasked by Wellington with holding the vital position of Hougoumont. And they were in there, left by Wellington to their own devices for the whole day to hold up the French on either side. They were enfilading fire over the walls, pinning down the French. Napoleon actually became obsessed with taking out these farmhouses and wasted a lot of the battle doing so and lost thousands of casualties. At one point, the French broke into Hougoumont. They got through the gates. There was a very bloody hand-to-hand -hand battle. And apocryphally, the only survivor from the French side was a drummer boy. He was taken to one side and sat down and something along the lines of, this is man's business, Sonny, you stay out of this. We know that this happened because Private Matthew Clay of the uh, 3rd Regiment of Guards left an account of the battle. Now he's an ordinary soldier, he's depicted here in this display. An ordinary soldier, a private, but he could read and write. Something unusual at the time. And he gives us an account of what it's like to be an infantry soldier. And the account would be exactly what an infantry soldier from a modern war would say. In his account he says that he gets lost the night before the battle, he falls into a ditch collecting water. He can't get his uh, brown best to fire because the wood's swollen up due to the rain. He has to pick up a fallen comrade's one. He gets shot through the top of the shako as well. And so this is an amazing insight into what it's like to be an ordinary soldier. At the time, most of the accounts were written afterwards by people who weren't even there or were based on the records of the officers and the senior officers. This guy was down in the mud fighting the battle. And it wasn't just at Hougoumont where the guards distinguished themselves. The 1st Guards Brigade were an instrumental part in devastating Napoleon's own Imperial Guard at the climax of the battle. A moment shown to great effect in the famous film of 1970, Waterloo. The next major war fought by Britain was the Crimean War that began in 1853 against the Russians. But the British Army was rusty and ill-prepared. The generals were out of date, the tactics were out of date, a lot of the equipment was out of date, and so the war did not go too well. The scene that we have here is a colour party of the Scots Fusilier Guards, which is what the Scots Guards were known in that period, and this colour party is out the front at the Battle of Alma. The Battle of the Alma was fought on the 20th of September 1854. It was a bloody and disjointed battle that ultimately did see an Allied victory. The Scots Fusilier Guards were in the second wave of British attacks when, due to some confusion, the battalion's colour party suddenly found themselves at the forefront of the fighting and very exposed. They become separated from the rest of the unit and have to defend the colours, which is the military term for their flags, against attack by a number of Russians. If you can capture your enemy's flag, take it back to your capital city, then you are going to be a hero and that regiment and even the army is going to be in disgrace for losing those colours. These guys here, these ensigns, are not going to give up the Queen's colours. The uh, sergeant in the middle, the colour sergeant, protected them, fought off a number of Russians during the battle. The officer and the sergeant were awarded the Victoria Cross, the brand new medal 
only instigated by Queen Victoria a year or so before for their bravery in protecting these colours. Uh, the second officer unfortunately died of fever afterwards and although he was in line for a Victoria Cross there was some confusion over whether it was a medal or an order and orders are not granted posthumously and so he did not get his Victoria Cross. But the other two soldiers did and their bravery in protecting a flag shows how important the colours were for the identity of the regiment. And to this day, soldiers mounting the King's Guard will march out behind an ensign with their colours and there will be a colour guard of armed soldiers on either side to protect the colours still. And it all goes back to scenes like this. So perhaps there's been a bit of mythologising around this. And in a lot of the paintings painted afterwards, uh, such as this one here, the officers are depicted in the thick of battle, waving their pistols and their swords. Well, they freely admitted afterwards that they had no time to use their weapons. They were too busy holding onto the colours and wielding them as a weapon to actually draw their pistol and sword. But, uh, you know, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. Ensign Robert Lindsay, who was the man carrying the colour, went on to reach the rank of Brigadier General and became a Member of Parliament. Sergeants John Knox and James McKechnie also won the Victoria Cross in this action. Knox in particular seems to have been a bit of a stud. Promoted without purchase afterwards, he then volunteered to lead a ladder party at the Siege of Sevastopol, where he was struck by a cannonball and lost his left arm. But this guy still wasn't done. He was posted later to the School of Musketry and only retired in 1872 as a brevet major. Who said you couldn't get promoted from the ranks in the Victorian army? After the Crimea, the guards fought in Egypt, Sudan and the Second Anglo-Boer War, winning more battle honours and glory for the regiments. World War I saw them very heavily engaged. In fact, they were even combined to form an entire division. The Guards Division fought at Luz on the Somme, 3rd Ypres and the heavy desperate fighting of 1918. But there is one unit that was formed that no longer exists. Let's hear more. The missing or the 6th Guards Regiment is the Machine Gun Guards. The Machine Gun Guards Regiment formed in the First World War when machine gunning was considered a specialist skill. The Army had a machine gun corps and the Guards, well naturally they wanted their own version. So they formed the Machine Gun Battalion and then the Machine Gun Guards Regiment. It only really existed for two years in that format before it was amalgamated back into the battalions and therefore it's very rare. Anything to do with the Machine Gun Guards is very rare. They're notable for the amazingly enameled cap badge that they would have been issued, of which those five points represent 303 caliber rifle shells and machine gun bullets. And we've actually, we've got a um, machine gun guards notebook and the, um, the trajectory notes, it's mathematics. It's amazingly technical how they actually learned all that stuff. Yeah, for the indirect. So, yeah, yeah. That's how they started using it, it was like indirect yeah. fire. As a it? form of artillery, yeah. yeah. So if you think they're mowing down the enemy coming across, these guys were scientifically working out angles with all the kit and all the sights on the machine guns, and that's how we used them. So obviously the Guards Regiment's still on operations now, and they've been very busy even since World War II. What's this display? What have we got here? So this is our Falklands display that we updated last year for the anniversary. In 1982, Argentina invaded the Falkland Islands, and the Scots and the Welsh Guards were put into the task force. They sailed down to the Falkland Islands uh, on the luxury liner, the QE2. Well, it wasn't luxury by the time they got on it. It had been stripped, and it certainly wasn't luxury by the time they left it with all those soldiers living on it for all that time. They had to do a PT round the deck, fire their machine guns over the side. It was no luxury cruise for them. When they arrived, the... Scots Guards went into battle in the last two days of the war at Tumbledown, captured one of the hills overlooking Port Stanley and forced the Argentinians to surrender. They fought uphill in the pouring rain in the darkness against a heavily dug in Argentinian enemy. And these were quality Argentinian troops as well with heavy machine guns. It was a very scrappy battle. The guards broke up, the Scots Guards broke up into different groups. Major John Keasley reached the top with his troops and cleared out a foxhole on the top and everything went quiet. 
He turned to his men to say, let's dig in. At that point, machine gun fire sliced across the clearing and he went down. He'd been hit in the stomach. He checked himself quickly and he realized that his heavy brass compass had caught the machine gun bullet. You can see the damage it's done. The bullet is still rattling around inside there. He had this pouch on the belt across uh, his midriff and that is what saved him. Had he had it on his webbing or anywhere else, the bullet would have gone straight through as it was this heavy brass compass um, undoubtedly saved him from serious injury, if not death. So obviously, quite recently, the guards have been serving multiple tours in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about some of that? Well, yes, it was the last major conflict that the uh, guards regiments took part in. Each of them did a number of tours. And we have a display here. What's interesting about this is that everything in this case has been there and done that. It was tipped out of the kit bags by the battalions when they returned from their tours. And so there's grass and dust in the pockets from Afghanistan. Uh, as a museum curator, I think that's amazing. Um, some of the things that we have in here, um, this always causes a lot of interest. This is a Martini Henry carbine captured by the Coldstream Guards in 2008. And I've actually had a look at this and it's not really a Martini Henry. It's actually a copy made in the Khyber Pass in a village whose blacksmiths specialize in making guns. And at some point they made this uh, to resemble one of the old rifles that the British would have used in Afghanistan in the Victorian era when we were first yeah, there. Yeah, during that second Anglo-Afghan war, Absolutely. I think they would have carried though. Uh, if you look at it up close, it's got gibberish on it that resembles English writing, and that's the giveaway that this is not a genuine gun. Whether it would go bang or not, I don't know. I don't want to have a go. <laughs> Fair enough. Ah, oh, what regiments, what history. So I think that makes it clear, guys. These lads are the real deal. They aren't chocolate soldiers. They're well-trained and battle-tested. So next time you see the trooping of the colour or the changing of the guard, just remember the rich and exciting history that these regiments have and the amount of training these guys have done. Okay, be sure to like and subscribe. I'll be back next Friday with another video on another fascinating aspect of British military history. Until then, guys, take care.